Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first installment of this season's Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series. Thank you all for joining us. Please find your seats and join me in welcoming the man that makes this all possible, Mr. Brendan Madigan. Yeah, what's up, people? Who's fired up for six feet of snow coming our way? Come on now, give it up for that. Six feet of snow. All right, guys, my name is Brendan Madigan. I'd like to cordially welcome all of you to the kickoff of our 17th annual Alpenglow Sports Winter Speaker Series presented by Tahoe Mountain Realty. It's been three years since we've been able to get together like this, so let's give it up for that. We've got a very, very special show for you tonight, a never before seen show. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Jeremy Jones is in the building. At least I hope so, or I'm buying a lot of beer. Before we get started tonight, we've got some throwouts. We've got some free stuff. Who wants some free stuff? Okay, we've got strategic positions all over the room. Hats. Beanies. Make some noise if you want some free stuff. Make some noise! All right, that was fun, always fun. All right, y'all, so I see a lot of new faces in the crowd tonight. Thank you for coming. The throwouts are done. As many of you know, the Winter Speaker Series has a two-part mission. The first is to inspire and motivate the amazing souls in the room to go and chase your own mountain dreams. All right, y'all, now you got to quiet down, listen up. Politely convey that to your neighbor for me. Shh. Who said mountain towns don't have any class? Come on, look at that. Exemplary. The second is to educate about and raise funds for local nonprofits who are making a tangible difference here in the North Lake Tahoe and Truckee communities. Now in our 17th year, we have arguably become the gold standard for adventure storytelling in North America. But we couldn't do it without some amazing, awesome partners. Our title sponsor this year is once again Tahoe Mountain Realty. A local business who sees the power of adventure storytelling and the positive impact it can have on a community. I'd like to specifically thank Jeff Brown and Jasmine Watts. I think, team, you're in the room tonight. Go ahead and stand up for me. Stay stood up. And Jasmine, let's give them a big round of applause. Come on, a big round of applause. Thank you for your partnership and more importantly, your friendship. The speaker series has always been an eagerly anticipated local event for the Lake Tahoe Mountain community, but now we're global because we have a live stream. And because of that, we've had major brands sign on to support us and you. These include DPS Skis, Arcteryx, Peak Design, Nerona, and Osprey Packs. Let's give them a big round of applause. We're also proud to call the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association an awesome partner. And we should definitely give it up for our generous host for the series, once again, Palisades Tahoe. Let's give it up. But that's not all. It, this thing takes an army. We have the backing of many long-standing and core local businesses. 
including Emerald Bay Wealth Management. Thank you, Hannah Sullivan. Best Day Brewing, the homie Ian is giving out amazing NA brew over there for free. Mog Rog Rotisserie, hopefully everyone got free food tonight. Alex, the founder of Mog Rog, not only is giving free food tonight, but he's giving 15% of sales throughout the series to the nonprofit beneficiaries. <laughs> Renaissance man, Ming Poon Photography. Let's give it up for Ming. Aaron Summer, Launchpad Consulting and Software Management. Sorry, Software Development. They can manage software too, for sure. Uh, the homie Daniel Cates and Technical Equipment Cleaners, Evolve Design Works, Mount Lincoln Construction, who's been with us since the beginning, and our media partners, Moonshine Inc., 101.5, KTKE, Truckee Tahoe Radio, and the Tahoe Weekly. We thank you. The tasty adult beverages that uh, hopefully everyone's enjoying tonight have been provided for free from Sierra Nevada and Joel Gott Wines. With 100% of proceeds, the benefits Low Food Lake Tahoe. So let's give it up for that, please. We have a line, but you know, please be responsible, but don't be scared either. But tonight is about Jeremy Jones and the art of Schraupenism. But it's also about raising awareness for Slow Food Lake Tahoe, who has a small army with us tonight. So with that, I'd like to welcome Trish Geary, the board president at Slow Food Lake Tahoe. Hi, my name is Trish Geary, and I'm the board president of Slow Food Lake Tahoe. On behalf of our organization, I'd like to welcome you to the 2022-23 Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series. We are extremely honored to have been selected as a nonprofit beneficiary for this event with Jeremy Jones. Thank you all for being here tonight and showing your support. Food insecurity is a real issue in our community and it is something we work to address. Since 2004, Slow Food Lake Tahoe has worked to educate the community about growing, preparing, and accessing local sustainable food. Our chapter is one of 100 that exist nationally under the Slow Food USA branch, and collectively we strive to unite the joy of food with the pursuit of equity and justice for all. Slow Food Lake Tahoe's mission is to connect our community to the enjoyment of good, clean, and fair food by inspiring a self-reliant food culture. We do this through our various community programs and projects and the timeless effort of our eight active board of directors. 100% of our time is donated to performing all administrative and financial tasks, project and volunteer management, marketing development, and getting our hands dirty in the gardens. Slow Food Lake Tahoe serves the Truckee Tahoe community, and you've probably seen us at the Food Bank Garden and Community Gardens, which are both located in the Truckee Regional Park. These gardens are set on approximately 5,000 square feet of land cleared by the Truckee Donner Recreation and Park District, and they are a unique and valuable resource to our community. The Truckee Community Garden was established in 2021 in response to community members asking for garden plots to rent. Through vigorous fundraising efforts and a lot of hard work, we successfully raised enough money and built this space, which opened in June of 2021. It is now home to 35 crit-approof garden beds, which include five elevated wheelchair accessible beds for those with limited mobility. These beds are available to rent for a nominal fee and we offer scholarships to those who cannot afford them. The Food Bank Garden is our largest and most expensive project. Since 2018, we've harvested over 2,100 pounds of fresh organic produce from this space. This includes the 550 pounds that we harvested this last year, and it was a record-breaking season. All of this yield is donated to a local hunger relief agency, Sierra Community House. These veggies are then given out to community members on distribution days, serving 150 individual units of produce per week to those experiencing food insecurity. The Food Bank Garden also serves as a demonstration space for those interested in learning what it takes to grow food in our high desert climate. 
and it's a classroom for our Grow Your Own workshop series and youth group visits throughout the summer. This year, we hosted 30 classes in the garden free of charge, teaching kids about growing food, exposing them to new ingredients, and shaping their understanding of a healthy environment. The Food Bank Garden is open May through October for people to visit. It is a hub for compost collection in town through our partnership with Keep Trucky Green. We have a sophisticated system of bins ready for dropping scraps 24-7 during the gardening season. We have successfully been able to divert over 2,000 pounds of scraps annually from the landfill and put them right back into the garden. We also partner with Don't Drop the Top, helping to collect plastic caps and lids, which are then recycled into beautiful park benches. And you may have seen some of them around town. So how do we do all this? We would not even be close to where we are today without our dedicated volunteers who show up to help us fulfill and progress our mission. Our board is always developing strategies for volunteer recruitment and retention. In addition to our board of directors and hundreds of volunteers, this year for the first time, we were able to hire a full-time garden manager. Without the garden manager position, we would not be able to run the food bank garden solely on volunteer support. And without the food bank garden, all of the programs we currently offer for free to our community would cease to exist. Our goal is to continue making the food bank garden a valuable resource for our local community to utilize and be inspired by. To learn more about Slow Food Lake Tahoe's project and programs, and how you can get involved, please visit our website at slowfoodlaketahoe.org. Thank you again for coming out to support us tonight and learn more about our growing organization. Cheers. All right, guys, give it up for Slow Food Lake Tahoe. Come on now. Raise a hand if you can hear me in the back. Sweet. Okay, grab your partner and tell him to All right. So team, storytelling has always been the key theme at the Winter Speaker Series. And it's safe to say there's so many dang people in this room. All of you love a story, right? When we listen to a story, we're transported to another time and place. And this is going to happen tonight when Jer talks. You're going to begin to blink faster. Your palms might sweat. Your facial expressions could shift. And all of those are signs that we are emotionally and neurologically engaged with what we are hearing. But even trippier, brains show in functional MRI scans, our brains light up when we listen to compelling stories. And crazy enough, our brain waves, I'm not making this up, I read it in a scientific journal this morning, start to synchronize, just like an AVI beacon, with the compelling story that you're listening to. Now the common thread of everyone in this room, in our community, listening tonight, is the need to fill our souls by being in the mountains, is that right? Our adventures lead to storytelling, which is as old as time. And stories help us see a situation from a different perspective. They can even be so powerful as to shift our core beliefs. And I'm convinced that in today's world, we just straight up need more of that. Listening. Listening. <laughs> Respect. Being open and compassionate with others in your life. And I point this out to emphasize that there is, there is magic in this room tonight that we have collectively built as a community. 17 years, almost 100 inspiring athletes, and over a million dollars raised for local nonprofits. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us on the ride. We haven't been able to do this since before COVID, so what I want you to do is lean over and hug your neighbor. It doesn't matter how stinky they are. 
Come on, bro. Okay, folks. I'd like to give a big... Okay, stop hugging. It's starting to get creepy in some cases. I'd like to give a big, warm Tahoe welcome to snowboarding icon and our own homie, Jeremy Jones. All right, you guys hear me okay? Let me get a little adjusted. Um, hold on. Dun, 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 dun. Maybe that's the wrong button. There we go. That's the right button. <laughs> um, before I get started, I can live anywhere in the world. Um, and there is kind of some seating in this middle row here. As long as Alzi's not here and gets mad about the fire lane. <laughs> um, but obviously we got amazing mountains. We got amazing... We got the lakes, we got the ocean, but I think it's the, or I know it's the people uh, that when I, my wonderful wife and I uh, decide to have kids, it was definitive, no questions asked, we are raising our kids here because of you. So thank you. So in the film world, we call this a cold opener. Um, I'm gonna dive right into it. Uh, I wrote this, I dropped my kids off at this, the best snowboard team in the world. Palisades snowboard team. Big mountain team. All you coaches, if you're in the room, you guys are doing God's work. But it was hard pack, it was early, and I went back to my car to finish my coffee, and I was out looking at KT not far from here. So many memories in one view. My first time in line, age 18, seeing all my heroes from, a, from the snowboard movies. Or at 20, when Mike Hatchett, the owner of Standard Films, asked if I wanted to film with him on the chair. But some of the worst ones, too. Mental and physical soul-tearing wounds that turn into scar tissue that never really heals. Of all the crazy places I've been, this single view right here has taken more friends than any in the world. Right in front of me is the spot I lost one of my closest friends, MC. Farther up the mountain, I see the chute where C.R. Johnson hit a rock and died on the spot. To my left, the tree that, Eric Rohner's, that took Eric Rohner's life. The building where we memorialized them and too many others is behind me, right here. The good memories are less vivid. So many cliffs stomped and lines ridden in perfect conditions with friends hooting by my side. So many love of sport hours spent riding technical speed, steeps and variable conditions and powering through bumpy outruns to build my legs and confidence so I'd be ready when the stars aligned on the distant trophy lines. My one and only descent of the iconic spine wall that towers above the valley, McConkie's, takes up space in my memory. Shane McConkie's death still so fresh when I walked into that lift line early on a powder day. Ski patrol surprised me when they said I had early ups because it was the first time and only time I'd been allowed up early. The line looked so good, said the patrollers on the lift. I had missed the memo, but they were letting me up early to ride the line that had been renamed in Shane's honor. Using the post of the eagle monument that held Shane's ashes, I shimmied onto the face, made a few technical turns, and controlled, free, 
in a controlled free fall, hit the exit air, surrounded by my slough, and stomped the landing. Yeah. <laughs> An emotional avalanche overcame me as I rode out the bottom, so I pulled over into a group of trees and wept. Surprisingly, there are a few other memories from almost 30 years and thousands of hours spent on this lift. I think the sparseness of my memories is because I am always so present and forward-thinking on the mountain. No reason to think about yesterday when there's so much to figure out today. Where's the best snow? What lines are in? Is it gullies, groomers, and cat tracks? The mountains force us to be present, and I wonder if that is the hook that keeps us coming back day after day, year after year. However, without thought, the past does guide. A gentle whisper in my ear, run, run after run, helps me cha charge blind rolls, dance through cruxes, and hit the sweet spot of an air. So much time and joy and pain from this single lift. Seasons and days pile together, but no two are the same. The steady teacher whose lessons are subtle but collectively significant. Mostly is the friendships formed here that stick with me. Now it is sharing the mountains with my kids. Combine the teachings tied to this lift, the joy and the pain, the friendships made, the conversations had, the informal chain of mentorship that naturally gets passed from generation to generation, and you come to understand how powerful a single chairlift is to a community. Thank you. And ironically, well, I shouldn't say this, but there's a whisper that it might open tomorrow. <laughs> um, so backing up real quick, I, um, youngest of three brothers, grew up on Cape Cod, uh, highest point, 200 feet above sea level. Um, hockey was a big part of our life, but um, I, yeah, I don't know if it was unorthodox or what, but um, my dad, the one thing my dad did instill in an early age with us was reading and art, and it was not about the outcome, it was about the process. Um, he liked to say, get on the other side of your brain and let it take you for a ride. Uh, so as we, luck, you know, as my parents found Vermont late, kind of as young adults, um, due to my grandfather, which coming from Cape Cod was like finding the North Pole. And I say that because I'm part of a huge family of about 96 immediate cousins. Um, if you, so 12, my mother's one of 12, my dad's one of four, Irish Catholics, do the math. <laughs> um, and roughly 90 still live on Cape Cod where the drivers, oh shit, we're not moving. Okay, we got some tech. <laughs> that is a good time to take a sip. <laughs> we got it? Okay, there's me and my wonderful brothers. Yes. Good old-fashioned bowl cut. Here's my dad, the painter. And now we're in Vermont. Um... <laughs> It felt like a normal family. <laughs> uh, but my parents, unlike how I am, it's like, drop us off, we'll see you at lunch, we'll see you at the car at the end of the day. Uh, but there was a poll that we had in Vermont that my brothers and I instantly were like, oh, this is so incredible. And it was the start of my early day of informal mentorship where we knew exactly who the best skiers were on the mountain. We tried to ride the lifts with them. And there was one guy, Bruins man in particular, who's hands down the best guy. And we 
Finally, my brother Steve got to ride the lift with him, and we're, and, you know, the lift ride then is like 25 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and he gets down, and he's like, I'm like, what was it all about, you know? And, um, and he's like, he skis every day. I'm like, oh my God, that is incredible. What's he do for work? <laughs> and he was a bartender in winter and painted houses in the summer. And my brothers and I went, when we reconnected with my dad, we're like, Dad, you wouldn't believe it. This guy skis every day. And at the time, my dad was working so hard that it was, um, sometimes he wouldn't be able to come up on the weekends. And so, suffice to say, my brothers and I quickly moved into the restaurant industry and the painting industry. <laughs> and we did that for quite a few years. Um, so... When I was nine years old, um, I went to a general store in the basement and there was a Burton Backhill. And at that time I was a skateboarder and um, it just was like a dream come true to be able to snowboard on a mountain. But no instructions, took forever to learn how to ride. We'd go, I'd ski all day and then at night I would um, go and we'd, we'd go with headlamps and, and snowboard. and. Uh, when I was 12, it was allowed at the mountain, and um, the skis went away after that. It was like I got off that lift, and, and things just went three-dimensional on me, and, and um, been hooked ever since. Uh, so my brothers and I lived, uh, I mean, we just loved the mountain, and at night, we'd watch our VHSs, and it was Scott Schmidt, and it was Tom Burt. Uh, those were the guys. <laughs> Just so happened to call this place home for a long time. Um, and we were all in on the mountains. And uh, so by 16, uh, I competed in everything, but I was, uh, as a professional, I turned pro uh, when I was 16, got third in my first race, and I got 40th in the first half pipe. It was 150 bucks to enter each. I quickly moved to racing. Won 900 bucks, was able to keep um, going to the next race and the next race and the next race. Uh, but it was always about all mountain riding. When I was 19, my brothers, uh, or my brother Steve called and said, hey, uh, you gotta come to Thompson Pass, Alaska. I'm like, well, I don't really have any money. He's like, sell the mountain bike, sell the tent. Um, we actually have a tent. We got a spot in our tent for you. Bring a sleeping bag and a ton of cliff bars. You're in. <laughs> and we, it was a mix of foot powered, plain, heli bumps. And uh, this, at the end of that trip, I got dropped off on Meteorite Mountain. And this is my brothers and I standing on top. And I knew definitively there was no going back. I didn't know how, but I was going to go to Alaska no matter what. And ironically, we would use the helicopter and then we'd hike to the road. And, um, and so has anyone seen the 50 Project of Cody Townsend and I doing this mission? Yeah. Amaz incredible work. Um, but you see that road hike, and uh, I had actually done it because we... We could pay 50 bucks to get dropped at the top, but then it would be another 50 bucks to get dropped from the bottom back to the road. So we walked to the road. I was the only snowboarder. At one point, I was traversing the mountain, and there was a huge grizzly bear. And, um, and I'm watching how fast he's moving, and I'm like, I can't. I was going through all this avi debris, and there was no way I could move that fast. I'm like, he either wants me or he doesn't. But um, <laughs> thankfully, he didn't. But it had been a dream forever to go and hike that thing on foot, and it was so awesome to do that with Cody. And um, yeah, so check out that deal. Uh, but along the way, we had this uh, kind of big mountain shaking moment when Doug Coombs and Noah Selaznik got uh, rode super spines. We'd never seen spines before, we didn't know they were rideable. And we, my brothers and I, from that point, became incredibly spine-obsessed. My brothers were actually guiding 
um, them with Mike Hatchett and Aaron Sedway took this photo and I went on a just a spine you know they just overtook my life um, pretty quickly I uh, TGR had started I was able to make some uh, make a living free riding in the movies this is a film paradox uh, Tim Manning instrumental in in so many of these standard films with the Hatchet brothers and this is Blackwood Canyon grizzly spine and uh, really Cool, uh, one of those things where sometimes you ride a line and you, you're like, man, that, I, like, I got that thing figured out. I can ride that thing all the time. This was one of those where I was like, man, that's like a one in 20. Um, I got so lucky on the bottom um, and just kind of the tranny gods came up and grabbed my snowboard and I somehow rode out of it. And it had not been ridden successfully there been a couple of attempts uh, for, I don't know, 15, 20 years until some um, really ambitious woman named Elena Height <laughs> nailed this thing um, a couple of years ago. So cheers to Elena. So I got, uh, along with my brothers, I got really good at using helicopters to uh, snowboard in Alaska and did a bunch of amazing snowboarding. And when I was 30 with a newborn daughter, uh, I was, at that point I'm getting paid because uh, I'm in snowboard films. And at this year, this um, particular year, I was in five snowboard films. I could basically shoot a video part in about three sunny days in Alaska. And so this was the biggest, potentially the biggest move that's ever been done. Career's cranking, got the newborn, 30, career's doing amazing. Um, but one of those movies I did with, was with Chris Edmonds called My Own Two Feet. And this was a foot-powered film, and it was a place I had been wanting to go to for a couple years, and I kept talking to... The, the existing film companies, and I'm like, I don't want to go in at sunset. Like we, like, and, and we were starting to hit boundaries. And it became clear to me, it was always about finding new dream lines. And once I started hitting boundaries, I'm like, I know there is so much more out there. And if we can figure out how to hike them and camp out there, we can do it. But there was all this, how are we going to charge the batteries? How do we keep the lenses unfogged? Well, Chris Edmonds figured that out. And the last um, kind of, I came home from Alaska after that's it, that's all. And I kind of the last time I was out with Chris, I rode this line on South Shore. And I um, kind of throttled this line, came out the bottom, and I was brought to tears, a white moment for me. And... It was wild because I, you, you know, I'd been all over Alaska for almost two months, and I'm like, I just got hands down the biggest high on this moment, and I went towards that moment and just went all in on foot-powered snowboarding, and to do so, I needed to shift my whole scene, and I needed new mentors, and my whole life has always been, when I say mentors, I mean people a little bit further down the road than I am, that have more knowledge that I can learn from. And so here I am with Jim Zellers, who, yes, Jim Zellers. Uh, him and his wife, Bonnie, had quietly been mastering uh, foot-powered snowboarding. It real all over the world, but their work in the High Sierra, uh, which I still consider one of the most guarded ranges, been incredible. Uh, so I learned a ton from Jim, uh, the Morrison brothers. This is us, um, and I think in one of their vans uh, a long time ago, you know, really early, um, getting ready. I think it was to go do Whitney, and this was probably the last time I saw their faces. Because I learned, um, can you see the little shadows there? That's Jim and John. Um, I learned like 20 years ago, you're probably not going to see them. And then two days ago, that's Jim and John. And I was kind of close. 
Um, and then we got Brennan Lagasse, who um, epitomizes a good riding partner. Uh, this past winter when we had like, I don't know, three inches of snow, I called him up jokingly and I'm like, hey man, I hear Friel's going off. <laughs> He's like, really? I was over at Rose. <laughs> And just that happy, down for it all. Uh, definitely had to learn to wake up in the dark, uh, long, walk really long periods of time to get to that beautiful view of the West. This is Nick Russell standing there, and it's what I, it epitomizes the wonderful problem that I have this uh, hit list that. You know, it takes a long time to cross something off the hit list, but you get to the top, and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe these. Uh, the, I think about climbing mountains as you, I always go into it with, I need 20 no's to be turned into 20 yeses. And I always know the last no is the hardest one to get because that's where there's wind loading and stuff. So it's always this big surprise for me to get to the top of the mountain. But anyway, you, you finally have the perfect cocktail of ingredients. You get to the top, you look out, and there's 10 more dream lines. So the list gets bigger. Um, so kind of figured it out a bit in this year, but it needed to work in Alaska. This is a photo Seth Lightcap took, and it's us just so what my brothers and I call spacemen on a tether. I mean, it's just so out of our comfort zone, clinging to this spine. Um, and because that was the thing. I mean, when we started doing the foot powered stuff, it was like, how's the hippie snowboard movie going? And <laughs> I wanted to go and ride the best rides of my life, though. Uh, and I felt like if I could figure it out on foot, I could. Um, oh, hold on. So, this is a, um, me camping at the top of what I still consider one of the best lines of my life, and I'm with Rylan Bell. And we had this great idea of, we're like, we're gonna climb this huge couloir, camp on top, and then we're gonna throw our gear down in the morning. And I'm like 10 feet to the top of this dream line. Then I'm going to walk over and ride this line. So we get to the edge of the couloir, and I got my only sleeping bag and only sleeping pad. And I, it, it's at that moment where I'm like, I need to let this thing go down this 3,500 foot couloir. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> but we do it, and I've never seen something accelerate like that and just tomahawking and it's going and, it, and, and we get to this um, and then there's the Berks run which is this basically a crevasse and Ryle and I are like oh my god the Berks run and the thing just barely clips the Berks run and then rolls into the flats and then we walk over and ride a rad line <laughs> and so this brings me to fear because I had so much fear throwing away this, the norms of this career of, um, you know, traditional snowboard filming. And part of it was, can I do it? What are people going to think? And, and so here's a little note on fear that I jotted down. I believe that fear is the most powerful and detrimental emotion in life and the biggest culprit keeping us from our dreams. For me, there are two types of fear. Fear of dying, which is good fear, and fear, fear of failure, which is bad fear. Astonishingly, astonishingly, I might have lost more sleep over fear of failure than fear of dying. Understanding the root of your fear and having an intimate relationship with your fear is critical. Fear can keep you alive, but it can also keep you from living. Yes, thank you.
Okay, so going towards that fear, I, something I never thought I would do is write a book. Um, yes. <laughs> so I have always kept a journal. I've always um, done art. And again, going back to my dad, just about the process. Um, never intention of putting that out into the world. And I, again, going towards that fear. And now I've done it enough where I'm like, never done this before, kind of nervous. I've determined that nervousness and excitement need to go hand in hand. And so I've done that enough where I'm like, all right, I'm going towards, you know, let's do this. But I still might not have done it if it wasn't for my neighbor, Chris Crossan. Um, and I met Chris at the bus stop. So our, every morning we would, um, all the, a bunch of trucky kids would go to King's Beach to the immersion school. Did you do that? <laughs> and this guy kept showing up with snow pants on and, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he was backcountry skiing every day. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. Um, and it turns out he's an artist. This is a board we did for uh, the Puerto Rico hurricane, raised $20,000 with his art on this board. But Chris, knowing, um, we would always talk about the snow conditions and had a very uh, like-minded mindset towards the mountains. And I knew that having Chris there to kind of corral my work uh, and, and really helped me to just really write freely and not be afraid of saying something wrong. Because here I am writing this book that like maybe you read it and make a decision and it doesn't go right. That's a scary thing. Um, so thank you, Chris, for the help on that. Experience is something you get just after you need it. <laughs> I am really experienced. <laughs> the trick is to become experienced without dying. I'm not here to say that I'm above any of that. Um, I honestly can, you know, there's that unweighted step and there's the, I mean, I think by my calculations, I've probably lost five or six of my nine lives. And I mean that where a massive slope settlement, a tomahawk where I'm that far from a rock or what have you, I do not stand up here and say, I got this all figured out. Those who aren't with us don't. It is serious stuff in the mountains. Um, we unfortunately lose about 120 people a year in the mountains uh, to, on snow, in avalanches. Uh, so it's, this is not fear mongering. The mountains are real. Um, so one of the things to get me over the, the kind of like who am I to write a book is I decided uh, I'm going to bring in a bunch of different vo voices. And so here's one of them. John Krakauer is a really, a, I went, got a, had an opportunity to go up to Nolly with him. Incredible shrapnelist. Uh, he's, you know, this is about him talking about many days he goes into the mountains and turns around. Doesn't like what he sees. And I think about that where... I keep track of when I've, how many times I turn around. When was the last time I turned around? And, and so when I'm in the mountains and stuff's a little weird, I'm like, oh, it's been two weeks since we turned around. We got to turn around. It's um, to flex the muscle. And if you've never gone into the mountains and haven't turned around, that's a little bit of a red flag. So Hillary Nelson, um, this was kind of weird, inner, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, but the reality is, is when she went missing, um, I got the first uh, copy of the book, and I opened it up, and the longest interview I have in the book is with Hillary, meaning her words were so 
resonated with me that she ended up being the longest interview in the book. And mind you, in the book, someone told me, they said, I did the math. There's roughly 350 years of experience in the book. Um, so here's a, something Hillary, um, you know, one of the questions I asked her, because I've had the, thankfully, I've had the opportunity to be in the mountains with her. And I just, I mean, she's so sturdy, and especially when it gets spicy, it's, um, and, I mean, her, her comfort over exposure was incredible, and then her ability to just keep going. And so my question here was, you have a knack for suffering. How do you keep going when your whole body is screaming to stop? So kids out there, listen up. Because I got two of them that tell me they can't go anymore. Not my daughter, but... The, the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good question. It's... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, Hillary would have liked that. <laughs> It's about focus for me. I know that suffering is a whole body experience, but men mentally I can focus on individual pains without physical distress. Those pains always shift as I keep moving. This keeps my mind active, and the feedback loop tells me that no pain is constant. It's shifting and changing, and therefore I can keep going because suffering is fluid. Plus, I always want to see what I can handle, and every day is different, so why not keep going and burst through the ceiling? So that sounds like great advice, but who's been on a mountain where you're like, I cannot go any further? Think of Hillary and get walking. <laughs> yes. Um, Jimmy Chin, um, you know, there's a, had some great times in the mountains with him, and it was an interesting thing. I asked him about fear, and to stay on that fear theme, you know, Jimmy, we know he's done some of the most incredible things in the world in the mountains, and he said, you know, people often ask me what the greatest risk you took in life. Uh, for me, it's clear as day what that great risk was. Deciding to leave behind all the exceptions of my parents. The pressure of what I was supposed to be doing. That was the greatest risk I ever took. Sorry, parents. <laughs> but to you kids, if something grabs the inner soul of you, I can tell you the more unorthodox it is, the fewer people are going to be on the sideline and say, that's a great idea. You should do that. When it came time for me to, uh, you know, we we're supposed to take the SATs and apply to college, I said, I'm out. I'm not I'm done. I'm out. That did not go over well. Um, and, I mean, I think it was until I was 26 that my mother stopped asking me uh, when I was going to go to college. And then I think it was at about 35 when she said, what are you going to do when you're done snowboarding? <laughs> uh, so another thing, we go into fitness. Fitness is the, the, uh, the, the price we pay for our powder. Uh, and Jimmy has this great line. Uh, you know, to me, it's not about getting in shape. It's about not getting out of shape. And I kind of run that deal where I'm like, I'm too lazy to get out of shape. I don't want to have to go on a diet. So I just... Keep a decent level of baseline. But there's really three people I go deep on fit. We're not that deep, but I give a page to. So there's Tom Brady. I don't know if I'd put him in there now, but he's in there. <laughs> New England, you cannot, you can take the New Englander out of New England, but you can't take the New Englander or whatever that thing is. But Tom Brady's obviously defying um, athletic ability. Anyone that's seen his, his college uh, workouts, they're horrific. Uh, so there's something to be learned there. 
Uh, then the second one is Laird Hamilton. We all know Laird. He's gnarly. Uh, I don't even really have to say anything. And the third one's a little bit more. You probably wouldn't guess this one, but it's this guy right here. <laughs> Jim Zellers. Never been in a gym. Um, usually shows up with, uh, I mean, I learned from him, as Nick said on this stage, like always bring a bag of potato chips uh, for when you get done. Uh, but here's Jim at 55 years old, ripping the rally for rocker course. Uh, and at the end of the day, why do we do all this fitness? It's so we can go out there and ride every day. And I remember I really, when I went to foot powered snowboarding, I started hanging out with Jim all the time. And I was like, I was 30 and I'm like, this guy is kicking my ass, biking, climbing, snowboarding. He's 40. I'm like, I'll get him at 40. <laughs> Turned 40, he's 50. Still kicking my ass, biking, climbing, snowboarding. Well, now he's recovering from a new hip which is kind of scary, because I had him with the old hip. <laughs> Jury's still out on when I'm 50 and he's 60, and I, I'm not, no money of mine's going down on them. Um, okay. So, as we walk into these mountains, it's so critical to be present, and I wrote something about that, uh, that really so much of this book is, it's a compliment to the avalanche classes, uh, you know, that are a little bit more, say, tactical textbook D. and I think mindset is such a big part of going into the mountains. And too often, when there's an accident in the mountains, we get hyper-focused on what that missed call is in the mountains, opposed to what led up to smart, educated people you know, making a call that cost them their lives. And that's, to me, where the learnings are. And so much in the book is about that. But I like this uh, passage. The mountains are whispering to us. Brainwaves and senses wide open and alert to pick up the words. Moods and, and lights, the mountains are whispering to us. The first... The first, as, at first, our minds are cluttered and noisy. We struggle to hear their whispers. With patience and openness, we start a conversation. What are they telling us? So kids, Snapchat, um, like, it gets in the way of what the mountains are telling us. So it's good to... <laughs> airplane mode. <laughs> and I'm as guilty as anyone, um, but what are they telling us? So we need to be present. Agendas and egos muddle their words. An open and quiet mind coupled with low expectations and acceptance of the mountains is key to the long life dancing in these untamed and unruly environments. Understanding when to dig in and push through the hard times, to be totally committed to a goal, charging into the dark unknown, past your comfort zone and past the boogeyman, but just as easily turning your back on the goal without hesitation when the door gets slammed shut. That is the dance. That is Shrapanism. So I first heard this line from uh, Chris uh, Crossan, and hands down, the most dangerous thing in the mountains is ego. And that's my ego, that's your ego, that's your group egos. Um, you know, this scar on my face, that's ego. Um, so I'm so acutely aware when I see someone flexing in the mountains and, and e their ego flaring up, I'm out. I want nothing to do with that. Um, and again, for my... Personally, it's like when I'm on, you know, when you kind of just are, can't go wrong, we'll get on these runs where everything's working and that's, you know, I've had, I've been slapped down on ego. So that's something I keep personally in check and really watch for partners. And I'd say the one constant consistency with my partners 
is no ego in the mountains. I can't deal with it. Uh, so this getting to a little more tactical stuff. Just a little note on, on what I call slab management. And so at the top you see obvious starting zones, just the convex rolls going. At the bottom you see these crown lines. When I start seeing crown lines going uphill, I get really scared. Uh, that's when islands of safety no longer work. And, and I put this slide in here because it, it's an example of why pictures to me are worth a thousand words. And we have the most incredible AVI Center that gives us our forecast and shout out. Are there any forecasters in the room tonight? Yeah, shout out to the forecasters. And shout out to the patrollers. I, I know everyone, yeah. Um, but anyways, photos of slabs so often happen on the same elevation, the same style of terrain, same aspect, and we are investigators to see what that is. And so I really just, that's why when we're in the mountains and if you see, uh, you know, a crown line, um, take a picture, tag the Avalanche Center, because if it's happening on a northeast aspect at 7,000 feet at Ward Canyon, it's probably going to happen on that same exact type of terrain at Deep Creek or Castle Peak. Um, so... Um, yeah, foot powered snow. This is a living in a tent. Um, it's glorious looking, but it's actually not that glorious when you wake up and your boots are frozen. Uh, and just a wild thing where I've done it enough. And, and so when we have these mountains, there's always, a, you know, we have an objective and it gets, we have a perfect time of day we want to drop in. So we know what time we want to leave camp. We always give ourselves extra time. And because I never want to rush in the mountains because that will affect the next day in the mountains. So I hate sweating in the mountains. It's just because I'm an all day, every day kind of guy. Um, but it's wild. Winter camping, those tent shots look cool, but it, it takes two hours to get a crew out of camp in the morning in the winter. Never seen it happen faster. Um, so you don't see that in the movies. Lots of little infographs that I doodle around on, and this is an example of risk for time of year and days on snow for time of year. So uh, as we get later into the winter, the snowpack simplifies. The higher sun angle does a lot of wonders to it, and so it's common if we have the honor to get off on KT maybe tomorrow, and you're like, man, I got off and I was following Jeremy, and he's kind of riding slow. I saw him go around like six airs. <laughs> it's December. Um, <laughs> I'm in it for March, April, and May. So it's stacking days for that, those later, later times. Um, so this is Elise. Uh, are, you in, are you here, Elise? No, she's not here. She's got a kid at home. Maybe she's watching online. And cheers to the online audience. <laughs> So Elise was so um, honest and giving uh, on the book. She was part of the, the horrific Tunnel Creek avalanche. And there's a lot of Elise in here. And, um, but one of the, here's a quote from her that I really enjoyed, uh, you know, that is guided from her, you know, pretty horrific experience. experience. But, um, and, and Elise, I've been in the mountains with her. She films with TGR. She's, you know, just phenomenal skier. But as, and there's a, uh, I don't know if Michelle's in the room, but I've been a part of so many crews with where you have the one woman and a bunch of guys. And, and so it's really, I was so honored to get the women's voice in here. And one thing I've always made a point is I think that we are stronger having a woman's voice in the mountains with us. Yes, yes. 
Cheers to the women. Yeah, the ego is not your amigo. Is the women, you could take a nap. You could go to the bathroom during that talk. Um, <laughs> I've never seen women with uh, flex and ego out there. So, but anyways, from Elise. Another powerful thing that has changed within me is finding my voice. It is not that I wasn't speaking up before this incident per se, but because moving through the mountains safely is a fairly black and white issue to me. I became more apt to vocalizing my thoughts, questions, and or concerns, even, even if it goes against the grain of the group. This is also enriched by not blindly relying on partners that seem way more experienced. It's best to always be a part of the conversation. So that's another thing I see in the mountains, male or female, where you got kind of that one, I see these groups out there and there's the one buddy who maybe took an Abbey one and they dug the snow pit and their friends are like, wow, he dug a snow pit, that was cool. <laughs> he must know what he's talking about. But if they get their head out of the snow pit, they'd be like, well, there's a natural avalanche over there. So just because you're not the most experienced person in the group, have your head on a swivel and you are part of that group. Uh, and I have, I go into language and framing in the book, and here's a note that I wrote on that. Language is important. Saying, let's go take a look instead of where you're going to climb and ride a line or suggesting I am going to start up the Widowmaker instead of I am going to climb and ride the Widowmaker. Subtle signals to everyone that our goals that day will only happen if everything falls perfectly into place. Everyone is clear that we can turn around at a moment's notice if something does not feel right. Um, so we got kind of a funky pack right this second and uh, so I put this in there. What to do when the Abbey Danger is high? Avoid Abbey terrain, 30 degrees and lower, go power surfing, ride a resort, Nordic skiing, build a snow cave, clean your garage, your closet, go meadow skipping. Um, so it's not that, I mean, tomorrow we'll probably have high Abbey danger, but right now we have this persistent weak layer, uh, and so now we're living with a deep instability that's dormant right now, this new load might change that. And the key to that is it's super aspect, um, you know, relevant. So it's know your aspect, know your angle, know the snow history. So that is so critical with what we're dealing now. Um, this is a chart that if anyone's taken Abbey course, you probably saw. And I was kind of at the top of that chart when I was 24. And like this chart makes no sense. Well, now I'm... Um, 40 something and I'm for sure at the far right of that and I don't know if I've met anyone that's been in the mountains for 30 years that's not at the far right so this is a note towards this and I think about Glenn Paulson a little bit with this uh, poem but I wrote this for uh, Chris Figginshaw I spent a lot of time with old man figs he's at home in the mountains steady and unflinching a deep but simple thinker his school is his eyes, so much time in the vertical world, walking, gliding, climbing, and being. Days turn into years, years turn into decades. The happy pessimist, untrusting of the snowpack, finding joy in harvesting the local wind buff or noodling the low angle fields of pow as he patiently waits for simplicity in the snowpack. Every day, every season, not cutting edge or boundary breaking most of the time, an elite, seemingly casual journeyman with a large and growing number of cutting edge descents around the world. Yes. It's a patient game we play because the fact, you know, one bad call can erase a lifetime of good calls and every day is a new day. Um, so, family, uh, lovely wife, daughter, and son, and this to me is uh, the ultimate powder day. We're out at Frog Lake, it's getting dark, um, and I, my life is set up around the mountains, 
and they've done, num you know, they're such a powerful force for me, but it wasn't until I had family that I really understood the value of the outdoors. How the time outside with kids and the lessons Mother Nature and the mountains teach us is incredible. Uh, an example of that would be it's my lovely wife, Tiffany. Um, so this is the start of a great and wonderful sandbag. <laughs> We're on our way to Frog Lake, and it is the most beautiful sunset. And I'm kind of like, yeah, it's pretty, but we should keep moving. And um, pretty soon, this is us. And we get to that. Uh, you know, the hut at, at midnight, and um, we're with some of my daughter's friends who may not, who may be here, um, but they're like, your family is crazy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the mountains are one of the few things where we got, uh, there's a book at Frog Lake about Frog Lake nightmares, and we got a page in that. And um, so we got a little bit off, teeny bit off course and but one of the kids is like I see the cabin and I'm like I don't think so but I don't I'm like they're happy they're I keep my mouth shut and but at one point I'm like I'm sorry but we're like we're at least an hour from the cabin when they thought they saw the cabin and there's nothing you can do about it um this is another example <laughs> this we got uh Michelle Parker Jim Elena Glenn probably found the secret doorway. We were with him that day. I have no, it's funny, I get in the mountains with Glenn a lot. I don't have a single photo of him. Um, he's like a snow leopard out there. <laughs> but this was classic, because Zellers is the master of the art of sandbagging, and I got him good on this day. <laughs> and we're at the top of this big face on the east side, and it's like we're looking down a 3,000-foot panel, and it looks like it rolls perfectly in. He's like, I don't know, man. I didn't see, <laughs> I didn't see the exit. Um, I mean, we walked right underneath that thing, and I never saw the exit of this line. I'm like, well, Jim, you know, it's it's just it's big terrain. Um, <laughs> he's, you know, big. It's out there somewhere. So we ended up down climbing. Um, but the one trait with all the partners that I want to be with, and Elena Hyde here sums it up, uh, is just so fired up to be out there. And it doesn't, it's not always powder and rainbows and unicorns, and we do get lost, and things happen, and there's, you know, humor is the art of it. Um, Ming, shout out to the cameraman, Ming clawing up a shoot. Um, Ming is no stranger to the joys of type two fun. Love. Um, Nick Russell. So Nick, I got to read this from Nick because he was like two months late on sending, missed the deadline on art of shralpinism. But I said, what is shralpinism to you, Nick? On this endless quest for our dream to sense, one must apply every skill acquired and lesson learned over the years in order to be safe and successful. It requires practice, creativity, patience, humility, and complete focus in the present moment. We ride a delicate line that is often blurred by ambition, intuition, and fear. Okay. So, Moving, um, we're almost towards the end here. Moving towards this beautiful earth. Um, I wrote this, this poem, because um, I love looking at earth from far away. No borders, no districts, no states, no nothing. Like it or not, we're all connected. One world, one planet. We all breathe the same air, drink the same water, and weather the same storms. My trash is your trash, your trash is my trash. Your problems are my problems, my problems are your problems. Hate and divisiveness is not the answer to those problems. Solutions lie in empathy and understanding. 
Science and knowledge need to be our compass. Humanity is in an all-hands-on-deck scenario. Find your lever, grab tight, and keep cranking it. Thank you. So, 2007, I started the vast conspiracy to bring clean air, clean water, and a healthy planet through fighting climate change. Um, pretty quickly, surrounded myself with uh, scientists, and just, you know, it, it was obvious that for us to get the CO2 reduction we needed, it, we needed it through climate policy. And this is us in 2017 at a bipartisan, the first ever bipartisan climate caucus meeting. So this is Republicans and Democrats. I'm happy to say there's uh, 87 Republicans now on this caucus. Um, we unfortunately haven't gotten them to take a a positive vote on climate, um, but we're, we are getting there. Uh, I, I am confident on that. Uh, we actually, not public, but we are introducing a Protect Our Winners uh, outdoor state climate bill uh, in the next coming months in Congress because we feel like we have these Republicans. But make no mistake about it, the hardest mountain in the world is Capitol Hill. Because <laughs> um, unfortunately those 87 congressmen uh, have yet to take a, a real vote on climate. And it's really hard to think. And uh, especially if you look at traditionally in our district, we you know, formally had the worst climate denier in uh, Congress history, Tom McClintock, we have a new congressman. I'm not, we'll, you know, it seems like um, he's in similar ethos as McClintock, but the jury's still out. But what's crazy to me is that, hands down, the biggest economic driver in our district is the eight or nine mountains, it's the, um, all the companies and businesses that rely on clean air and clean water and to protect our winners, we call that the outdoor state and it's um, bigger than the extraction industry, bigger than the pharmaceutical industry, bigger than the gun industry and there is not a single elected official that is afraid of the outdoor state because we suck at coming together and sending a clear message that we will not accept a climate denier in office. But we did pass an incredible climate bill by the narrowest of margins. Um, the final, we don't know exactly what pushed it over the line, but I can say a day before uh, the, the final piece, Senator Manchin uh, moved on it, is he got a letter hand delivered from Snowshoe Mountain, which was the biggest jobs creator, uh, employer in the state of West Virginia and the biggest taxpayer. And, uh, and at POW, we call this bill the BFD, the big fucking deal bill. <laughs> And it is igniting the climate, clean tech future. Um, when it first came out, it looked like it was gonna mean about $360 billion invested. Immediately it was 30 billion, um, got announced in clean tech manufacturing, mostly in red states, employing almost 10,000 people. And so we are off and running, and I can now, I was on a college tour before the um, election, and, and I got to stand up for the first time and look out at these kids and say, we have a shit ton of jobs coming your way. 
This is an exciting time. All right, the last thing that I want to go over here, um, hopefully I can find it. So this is Connor Ryan. Uh, you should watch this movie, Spirit of the Peaks. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, indigenous skier. And I asked him, there's a long interview in the book, but I asked him this question. There aren't a lot of indigenous people sliding on snow or at, at the resorts. How does that make you feel? Well, I see it as a reflection of everyday society. Resources are extracted from the land and become the wealth of people who aren't native. In that way, skiing can feel like an, ex an extractive industry. Even though I love skiing as much as I could possibly love anything, I still recognize how the industry exists by profiting off of stolen land. Yeah, it's hard stuff. This is hard, this whole, it, um, as indigenous person, I feel incredibly lucky to have a career where I get to be out on the land every day, but I also think, dang, if other indigenous people could be a ski patroller or a ski instructor or a lifty or whatever, their mental health and well-being would be so much better. Any job in the outdoor industry could be really impactful. So, I say that because I think it's really important, and I, want, I don't know if anyone from Palisades is here, but I want to thank them for changing their name. And I know Connor wants to thank them for changing their name. I know it will take time, but you are the, on the wrong side of history if you're in that grumpy, why did we change the name, wham, wham, wham. <laughs> Still trying to find the slang. Right now I'm kind of with Pallywood, but um, if, it, it, something's out there. Hopefully we can find it. But um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it means the world. And pray for snow. Thank you. All right, y'all, give it up for Jeremy Jones. Thank you.